Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Goldberg. And I'm Donnie Polliner. And we are the chair and vice chair of the Watson Student Advisory Council. We'd like to extend a warm welcome to parents, relatives, and friends as we kick off Family Weekend at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. We invite you to stick around after the event to grab a snack and wander around Stephen Robert Hall, otherwise known to students as New Watson. The Watson Student Advisory Council is a student-led advisory committee that serves as a bridge between the Watson faculty and student body. We provide student perspectives to help the Watson Institute best fit students' academic, postgraduate, and community needs. Examples of projects we've undertaken include speaker series events and peer mentoring programs. This semester, we're working on a climate survey to collect student feedback on Watson initiatives. We are also planning a Watson student formal for November. Today, we have the honor of introducing our featured speaker and moderator. We are privileged to be joined by Watson Senior Fellow and alum, Leon Rodriguez, for a conversation about humanitarian approaches to US immigration systems. Leon served under former President Barack Obama as Director of US Citizenship and Immigration Services from 2014 to 2017. In that position, Leon directed the implementation of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arri Arrivals policy and other elements of President Obama's 2014 executive actions on immigration. He also oversaw USCIS's refugee processing during the period of large-scale admission from Syria, Iraq, and Somalia. Currently, Leon is a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Safe Earth Shaw LLP. He also serves on the board of HIAS, a refugee resettlement organization, and is chair of its External Affairs Committee. In addition to his service at USCIS, Leon has served in various other government, government positions, including as director of the Office for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from 2011 to 2014. Leon currently holds a study group with Brown students in which he discusses themes and takeaways from his extensive experience with the U.S. immigration system. We are also joined by another Brown alum, Sarah Baldwin, who will be moderating the event. After concentrating in comparative literature at Brown, Sarah moved to Paris, where she lived and worked in publishing and translation for 11 years. She has worked at Brown since 2000, when she became Director of Communications at Albert Medical School. She worked in communications at the Watson Institute starting in 2012, first as director, then as writer and podcast host. She is currently a freelance writer for several university magazines. Please join us in welcoming Leon Rodriguez and Sarah Baldwin. Thanks, guys. And um, welcome, everybody. Welcome to Brown. I hope you have a wonderful family weekend. Um, as uh, they said, please stick around for refreshments after this conversation. And this is going to be a conversation. I'm going to ask Leon some questions. And then I will open it up to questions. And we have two live mics, if you don't mind coming up to the mic, introducing yourself, and asking your question. Um, but first, I thought we should start, Leon, by defining our terms for this conversation. Um, because I think those of us not in the business use um, migrant, immigrant, and refugee somewhat interchangeably, unless we're paying close attention. And I wonder if you could just sort of get, differentiate those terms for us and why the differences are different. And then maybe talk about how the term refugee has changed since maybe how we conceived of it in World War II, after World War II. Sure, and then in the second hour, you can ask me the remaining <laughs> questions. I always have um, questions. Yeah. My question. um, so, um, Let's, I probably should actually work backwards because probably the, 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 the basic term is actually immigrant. Mm -hmm. uh, an immigrant, from a legal perspective, um, you know, placing aside just sort of the more colloquial perspective or cultural perspective on what, what an immigrant is, uh, immigrant from a legal perspective is somebody um, who has been a national of another country uh, who has then now had been admitted to legal permanent residency in the U.S. Um, so that, that's what in, in the business, as it were, we call an immigrant. So it's not quite a citizen, um, but it's also not somebody who is here temporarily. It's not somebody who comes on a work visa for a few years or for a season uh, or somebody who visits as a tourist. So, so that's, that's what we think of as, as an immigrant. Um, but even I will use the word immigrant a lot more expansively than that, than that legal uh, definition and really think about anybody who, who has a background in another foreign country uh, who was not born a U.S. citizen 
and who is in some way participating in our social, cultural, and economic life in the United States, whether it's for you know, six months or for, for a lifetime as, as somebody who has a, uh, has a green card. So that, that's kind of the, at, at, at the center of that. Um, a refugee, uh, and, and, and this is a, a, an important word to think about legally, because the next thing you're gonna ask me is what do I mean when I say humanitarian? Uh, uh, in, in part turns on how we define a refugee. So refugee, the origin of the term, the legal term refugee, uh, is in the uh, Geneva Conventions on Refugees uh, that were uh, reached right after World War II. Uh, a number of signatories, surprising signatories, by the way, uh, including some countries that are now sort of generators of refugees. Uh, uh, among those signatories, but where basically a number of countries, uh, including the United States, agreed on a, on a foundational definition of what is a refugee. And that is somebody who has either uh, experienced persecution or fear, or reasonably fears persecution as a result of their national origin, their race, their religion, their political opinion, uh, or social group. And you might want to put social group uh, as question number 10, um, because that is also another hour discussion as to what that means, and you all will have ideas on what that should or should not mean uh, a as well. So, but, but when we think about people who sort of uh, come to the yes as forcibly displaced, um, it is a much larger group of people than the people who fit that very technical legal definition uh, of, what is a, of what is a refugee. Um, and while we're on the subject, when, we, when you hear about uh, asylum seekers or asylees, those are people who are already in a particular country, in our case in the US, uh, who are basically asking to be treated as refugees, who say, I meet the qualifications of, of a refugee, I just don't happen to be outside of the United States uh, right now. But you know, uh, England has the same definition, and France has the same definition. There are many, many other countries who are signatories to the Geneva Convention uh, who all use uh, the same definition. Uh, migrant, on the other hand, is a term that does not have a legal uh, meaning in the immigration uh, law. Um, I certainly understand it to be somebody who um, goes from one place to another in order to be in that place uh, uh, for some exp extended period of time. Um, but it is used in the politics of immigration to say somebody who's not a refugee. Uh, so somebody who is basically uh, going from one country to another, but we want to make clear politically that this person uh, does not technically qualify as a refugee and should not enjoy the benefits of being a refugee, even though that migrant may be somebody who comes out of her, you know, terrible need, just not the kind of need that qualifies them to be a refugee. So there's an implication of choice. They have chosen. That is correct, that mm -hmm. there, is, there is an implication of mm -hmm. choice. Mm -hmm. Which does change one's point, can, could change one's, how one views people called migrants versus people called refugees. That's interesting. Um, but how, has the definition of refugee sort of even gotten broader in recent years? The way, the way in which it's gotten broader is that the scenarios that can make people refugees uh, have, have grown more, more, more complex. Um, and also, uh, I think politically we've had, um, we've had an intention to let that happen. At least some of us have had an intention to, to let that happen, to have that definition expands. So, so I think historically, um, we think of refugees in, in sort of the World War II context. Um, and, and we think about it very much in sort of the, the Nazi occupation as being sort of the, the archetypal event that led to uh, the creation of the refugee uh, conventions. And so we very much in that context uh, focus on a uh, state actor uh, you know, a, a formal government actor with a seat at the United Nations um, who um, uh, persecutes some portion of the people under that government's 
uh, uh, rule, whether it is in that country or in a colony or in an occupied country or something like that. So that, that is how we sort of traditionally thought about it. Uh, and that that person is identified most classically because of their race or religion or political opinion, to place aside the other uh, uh, category. Social group had not historically been a group that was widely used uh, in, in, the, um, in, in, in the definition of, of refugee. Um, as it has evolved in more recent times is there is a realization that various kinds of non-state actors mm -hmm. uh, may engage in conduct very, very similar in its uh, characteristics as persecution by a government. So there is a threat of murder, there is a threat of torture. Uh, and the, and the, the legal doctrine that has evolved out of that is that that would qualify somebody to be a refugee if um, that kind of conduct um, is either actively tolerated by the, the, the government on the books for a particular place, um, um, or that government is simply incapable of protecting uh, would, its people. Would a contemporary example be Haiti today? Uh, a contemporary example could be, could absolutely be Haiti um, or for example, or, or Central America, I think is the one we, 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 mm -hmm. we fight over a lot um, here in the US right now, where you, you, have, um, uh, you, have, you have gangs, you have cr criminal organizations that very often effectively replace the government of the places, uh, you know, the, the municipal environments in, in, in which they're um, uh, functioning. What becomes where, where the debate comes is, you know, there's no question when we're talking about, let's say, Central America, countries that have the first, second, and fifth highest homicide rates on the planet, uh, there's no question that people are in, in a level of danger that is akin to a situation of war uh, in those environments where, um, where it becomes difficult is we're not really talking about race, we're not really talking about religion, we're not talking about uh, national origin, we're not even really talking about political opinion, we're talking about this very amorphous term, the last one that I mentioned, which is social group. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've really engaged, honestly, in a lot of creative lawyering, those of us who do any kind of legal work for um, uh, people in situations like that, uh, to articulate what legal group somebody fits in. So an example might be, uh, you own a small business in a town and you're a victim of extortion. So your social group are small business owners in you know, this particular town might be the way you might define uh, a social group. There is a lot of resistance in other quarters to that very sort of expansive definition of what a, what a social group might mean. Or where it's also gotten difficult is in the context of domestic violence uh, and defining victims of domestic violence in places where policing institutions are absolutely incapable of protecting those victims, mm. uh, defining them into a social group that will then entitle them to protection uh, as either refugees or asylees here in, here in the US. That's interesting, I hadn't heard that. Uh, I was thinking that you might um, introduce the notion of climate refugees. Um, so I, yes, so that is the next, uh, so, so, so for me, and this is why I think the, uh, the term, you know, why, why the term is humanitarian immigration. Yes, which I love. Um, because I believe, and I think, a, a, you know, in highest, the organization on whose board I sit believes, and, and many of the organizations involved in refugee resettlement, really think much more in terms of forcible displacement rather than the very clinical definition of what is a refugee. And so forcible displacement greatly enlarges the group of people who have to leave their homes because of some circumstance that makes it untenable to remain in those homes. Um, the fact is that uh, what is, you know, right now we have, uh, I just sent me some talking points last night. Uh, there are 100 million people uh, who are defined by humanitarian organizations as displaced 
in the world right now. That's an estimate of how many there are. That number is going to uh, grow uh, geometrically because of climate change. We are already seeing climate displacement now. It is not insignificant, but it is poised to grow uh, much, much, much larger. Um, and so that is going to become a humanitarian demand on the entire planet as people leave situations that become unlivable, whether because of governments or not, um, uh, people will uh, leave situations that become unlivable to move elsewhere uh, in the world. The reality is, which is, is already the reality when we talk about people migrating out of what we argue is, or some may argue, is purely because of poverty, uh, is that climate displacement, like poverty, is almost inevitably accompanied by some kind of government dysfunction. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some government, there, there is either corruption or uh, persecution or some other government conduct that we would characterize as, at a minimum, abusive, that often accompanies those things in, in you know, often we, you know, we, in, 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 when I'm talking to other humanitarian immigration lawyers and we're sort of telling each other the truth is, you know, we admit that a big pe reason why people pick up and migrate may simply be because they're poor. Uh, and, and that, and we, you know, we are frustrated that there's not a way to help them just because they are poor. Uh, and similarly, I think we're going to find ourselves asking that same question. Uh, when we start seeing large numbers of climate refugees mm -hmm. yeah. um, in, in the probably not distant future. So why should someone have to leave home because of poverty? Why can't they have poverty kind of alleviated at home? Um, is that, I mean, that's your mindset. That, that, that I think that is a mindset, but I, I actually, no, I, I think the mindset is actually a lot um, colder than that, which is I think the mindset is it's just not our problem. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of, you know, out of the very goodness of our hearts, we're taking in refugees. We're not even sure we want to do that, actually, but what the hell, that's what the law says. Mm -hmm. um, but people coming just because they can't find work and are poor, that's just not our problem. And I, I've, I've had senators say that straight to my face in, 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 a, in a hearing, exactly, exactly what I just said. In fact, you guys can probably guess who it was. <laughs> <laughs> I want to um, have you, you spent a lot of time in, in a government agency, and I wanted to ask you to talk about how this sort of intersection of humanitarianism and immigration. So how are humanitarian concerns sort of interwoven in the U.S. immigration system? Are they, is there kind of a steady state, or do they wax and wane with each administration? How fragile are they? They did not exactly wax and wane until January 20th, uh, 2016, 2017, 2017. Uh -huh. uh, I waved goodbye to President Obama on Air Force One, and uh, by that weekend, you will all remember, uh, was the implementation of the first Trump era uh, refugee ban. So that prior to that, largely refugee admission had been a bipartisan um, uh, issue. Um, you know, I remember talking to senators like Orrin Hatch, for whom this was something that was really important, something they really believed in. Um, that had flipped uh, by that point. That was no, there was no longer a, a bipartisan consensus at that point. But otherwise, going back, really back to World War II, this was, you know, there's, there certainly were, was strong xenophobia and strong opposition to certain kinds of, of, um, of immigration, but refugee admission as such within those definitions that I shared before, um, there had never been uh, any, any real divide between the parties mm -hmm. on this issue before that. Mm -hmm. And how does that affect your work? I mean, you can describe and imagine how it affected the people who were still in government, but how did that affect your work? How does that affect your work as an immigration lawyer, humanitarian immigration lawyer? So I, I most of my work, uh, just to be to be candid with everybody, I'm, I'm a business immigration lawyer most of the time. Okay. So I have, that's my, that's, that's my day job, that's how I actually earn my living. 
um, but I do do both in my highest service as an advocate uh, and also pro bono. I do do a, a fair amount of uh, humanitarian uh, immigration work in, in, in that way. Um, it, you know, very much put us on the, you know, truly on the defensive. Um, so, for example, one of the things where um, the, the immigrant advocacy community immediately went on, 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 the, on, on defense was uh, Attorney General Sessions uh, mm -hmm. issued an opinion that basically foreclosed the ability of um, either victims of gang violence or victims of domestic violence to assert asylum claims in the U.S. And so there, there was, that's one example of tons of litigation that occurred in those years. Of course, all the refugee bans, the uh, uh, so-called Muslim bans, uh, all of those were also uh, attacked in court. Uh, mm -hmm. And actually, I spent a lot of time um, filing amicus briefs and uh, declarations in support of various lawsuits in that time. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, generally pro bono in, in order to resist, resist those efforts. I want to turn now to, um, to campus and your study group, which you have been leading for since the beginning of the semester. And in your study group, you're looking in part at why Americans accept what you call a dysfunctional status quo. So I wondered if you could talk about what that status quo is, which I can imagine, and sort of how and why it's maintained. Um, so I wonder how many people, because I probably of all the rooms I could be in, I'll probably get a few people who will, who will actually know about this. Uh, and I imagine a few of you actually listen to the, the, the New York Times Daily, the podcast, The Daily. I see nods in the audience. Uh, so I think it was the episode two days ago um, that talked about the polling data um, that showed, in fact, a, what now appears to be at least a, a pretty likely Republican capture of the House, but also had lots of really in-depth granular information uh, about the, the attitudes of voters um, uh, right now. And so one of the things they asked about was nationally, what, it, what is your top voting uh, issue? Uh, and overwhelmingly, both Democrats and Republicans cited the economy and jobs uh, and inflation as, as top issues. 5% uh, of the studied group identified immigration as a top, top, voting, top voting issue. Uh, and then when you broke that down even further um, and you took that 5% apart and took it apart by, by partisan affiliation, 12% of the Republican respondents saw immigration as an important issue versus 1% of Democratic respondents, meaning that the, the political side that has um, is, is, is concerned that you know, we're, we're being overrun at the border, that is frustrated by the inability uh, to essentially contain what's going on at the border, uh, is very motivated politically, or at least in this poll is very motivated politically, whereas uh, anybody advocating for a more generous system is not. Uh, and on the whole, most people are not motivated politically on immigration actually at all, even though you know, like it's what I do every day, so I find it hard to understand because I'm really <laughs> motivated. But I, but, I, but I think I need to understand that there's lots of people who are motivated by other things than that. And, and so I, actually today in the group, and I know there's a few of you here from the group, we had a pretty, um, pretty intense, and the conversations have all been intense. Today was our third session about the fact that for many Americans, the status quo works exactly the way that it is. So even though, you know, we'll pop on CNN and, and, and we'll see, uh, you know, for those on the left, those of us on the left, you know, we'll see, um, you know, people at the Darien Gap risking their lives and, and, and in danger. Uh, on the right, we'll see examples of immigrant criminality. Um, the fact is most of us, other than that, you know, sort of very dramatic TV, are not really animated politically 
uh, because in reality, in our day-to-day -day lives, the issue doesn't necessarily affect us. Mm -hmm. uh, and so even though, for example, we were talking about the, the high potential for exploitation of, of particularly undocumented uh, workers, um, the reality is most people don't, aren't actually worried about that. Mm -hmm. um, even if they may themselves be directly or indirectly beneficiaries uh, of, that, of that undocumented labor. So, so that is why in my mind, there, you know, that's why we haven't had, after two decades of talking about it, efforts by Bush, efforts by Obama, we still haven't had comprehensive immigration reform. Is it likely? Um, not, um, not, certainly not at the balance of this, this current Biden term. I don't know what will happen in 2024. Right now, though, there is the, the political alignment in Washington is not, is not favorable to it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, you're, in the study group, you're eventually um, going to ask your students to sort of envision um, a politically viable, somehow affordable, humanitarian immigration framework um, that takes into account both the real needs, which is more countries should right. be accepting more people because of that's the numbers, and then the the impacts on on a given society, whether they're real or imagined. And um, I wondered if any ideas are percolating yet. Um, we're we're running a little behind because um, the uh, the uh, the conversations get very uh, intense on whatever the subject of the day is. So I, I, unfortunately, even though next session is the session where we're supposed to actually start putting ideas out on the table, uh, and I imagine they're percolating because I asked the students to to start thinking about it, and I'll be thinking about it right now. I I don't know how much they're percolating because we've been um, we've been really wrestling with. Um, a lot of the issues, actually interestingly, our second session, um, the speaker was the second Bush director of USCIS. So the same job I had under Obama, he had under Bush, he's a friend of mine. We've actually collaborated on some humanitarian immigration projects, uh, particularly advocating for protection for Ukrainian refugees. Um, and um, when I recruited him to talk to the group, he said, do I get to talk about the border? And, and I said, yeah, absolutely, and you, they need to hear whatever you're gonna say, they need to hear. And so he, he presented a pretty hard, he said, I'm gonna give them a hard line view, and sure enough, he did present a pretty hard line view, um, suggesting his view that the uh, asylum system is being abused, that a lot of the asylum claims are frivolous that are being used sort of as, as a way to enter uh, enter the U.S. That he's from Florida. He thinks that what um, the the Martha's Vineyard flights were great. Uh, he's all for his governor having done that. Uh, and it was it was it, you know, I, I, Brown is not different politically than the one that I attended in in, in from 1980 to 1984. Not much different. Um, this did not go down well uh, with uh, with the group. But I think it did give. Uh, the students a real flavor of the challenge. If we are going to craft uh, politically and financially viable changes to the humanitarian immigration system, I thought it was really important that they see what the resistance looks like. Uh, and so I think now we're trying to get a he our head around, so what, what can we do in a world where this is you know, a widely held, the, the views they heard are widely held political views. I think it's great that you brought in very different points of view. Um, are there any non-US immigration systems that we can learn from? Uh, absolutely, uh, in fact, I, I, you know, we copy off one another, actually. The, the countries that are welcoming uh, uh, to, to, to any degree, we do copy off each other, so, um, Remember when I when I was in my role, we would frequently gather with the other English-speaking countries to sort of compare notes, both from a, uh, an integration standpoint, but also actually from a national security standpoint, and sort of you know reasons why we we exclude people were also things uh, that we um, um, discussed one another. But you know there are some interesting examples out there, and one. 
Uh, one that I think we are in the process of copying right now, I think, to, to good outcome is back in the Obama years, we looked at the model that Canada was using uh, for refugee, uh, uh, refugee resettlement, uh, which worked significantly, to a significant degree with private sponsorship. Uh, so that groups of, um, of individuals or families or even businesses in some cases would sponsor refugees, whether back then it was from Syria or from different places, uh, in, in either complement or supplant uh, whatever role the government might play uh, in doing that. And so what we've seen actually uh, both with uh, you know, the Afghan uh, crisis, but actually to a much greater degree with the Ukraine crisis, uh, is that we've now started to see in the U.S. what are called welcome circles. Mm -hmm. And we're really looking at that. That's the model we're looking at. Uh, we're starting to see welcome circles, which are groups of just private citizens um, who are uh, making both financial commitments, personal commitments, and re even emotional commitments um, uh, to supporting uh, refugees. And again, they can be families, they can be groups of people, often they're congregations. My, my, my synagogue, actually, we, we, did, uh, we ourselves sponsored an Afghan family um, um, and as a community ended up you know, gathering up furniture and food and all kinds of things, including money as well, uh, to support that family. So that, that's something we weren't really doing a lot of uh, that is now becoming very much part of the, the parlance uh, among refugee resettlement organizations. Um, and highest, the one that I, that I work with, is one of nine sort of major refugee resettlement organizations that we have here in the U.S. Most of them, like highest, are faith-based mm -hmm. uh, in one form or other um, uh, that, that provide these kinds of uh, uh, services. I think the challenge for me is that this not supplant us also making a very significant governmental and broad societal investment, that it should not become a purely uh, individual uh, effort. Mm -hmm. There's a recent episode of Trending Globally on some local efforts that, um, with Afghan refugees that are very similar to what you just described. And, and a family here in, in Providence that's, that's yes. new. Oh, wow, that's, that's fabulous. Yes. That's right. um, but so before we leave the classroom, I wanted to uh, ask you what it's like for you to be back at Brown. And uh, tell us about your time at Brown. What did you study? Uh, not much. <laughs> <laughs> you turned no, out okay. No, 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 no. I, I, uh, yeah, it's funny because I was, I, I was, you, you'd been good enough to send me your questions in advance. So I'm going to answer the questions in, in reverse. Um, I was a disastrous student as a freshman uh, and became a um, sort of unmemorable student for the balance of my time here. Um, I still learn things here, both in my classes uh, and then just from being around on this campus that I don't actually believe I could have learned the same way somewhere else and which have been deeply influential to me in what I have become. Can uh, you get, be specific? Yeah, no, no, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain a few things. One, um, there were two courses uh, that I took, the most important of which was uh, social and intellectual history of the United States with Professor McLaughlin. I see some people who could possibly be my age who might remember uh, uh, Professor McLaughlin. Um, and he revolutionized my view of history, which in turn revolutionized my view of politics because history as it was taught to us in school was the history uh, of the deeds of great men generally on the battlefield every once in a while in government. Uh, and ignoring the way in which both intellectual trends and social trends that actually affected everybody and, w and in which everybody participated um, were really what was sort of driving the arc of, of, of history. And so that the history was the history really of everybody, not just of sort of the guys on the top. Um, and, that, and that sort of, in turn, as I said, revolutionized my understanding of politics because it made me think a lot more about the structural reasons why things are a certain way, whether we're talking about immigration, whether we're talking about civil rights, whether we're talking about poverty, 
uh, it made me understand those things. And the other class that, uh, uh, that I just wanted to mention is Mary Jo Buell's women's history class, uh, which nobody ever believed that I took that because I was intellectually interested, but truly I took it because I was intellectually interested in it. So that was one thing. Um, but also the other thing that was very influential to me back then, things that I shuddered at at the time, but made me realize that every once in a while in, 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 in political things, you need to be willing to sort of shake things up. Uh, and so my freshman year, um, the director of the CIA spoke on campus, and uh, 20 or so students stood up, turned around in their seats, and recited the poem Jabberwocky in the middle of the director's speech, which I, which I, I was horrified. I w was desperately hoping it wouldn't happen to me any time when I spoke uh, <laughs> here on campus. But it was like a uniquely Brunonian way of kind of like throwing a grenade into the middle of the room and, and really driving the conversation uh, to, another, to another place. The same thing was, a number of you will remember, the suicide tablet referendum we had here back in 1985. Again, not the way, I don't have the temperament to do those things. Oh my God, yeah, yes. you, you would remember that. I forgot about that. Um, not my temperament, but a thing that is so challenging about the way you think about a particular issue mm -hmm. uh, that, that um, it, it made me realize that sometimes to sort of drive political change, purely clinical discourse is not enough. Mm -hmm. um, that you, you need to kind of like make people a little bit uncomfortable. Um, that that's not necessarily uh, a bad thing. So um, I shared with you before we started that, that then in you know, the last 10 years or so, every time the weather started to cool in fall, I started being like, God, it would be great to be back. In some university, Brown would be nice, but I'm not sure they'll take me back. Uh, and then all of a sudden, just out of, like, literally out of the sky drops this opportunity. Uh, and so I'm, it's, uh, it's like a kind of a dream come true, literally a dream come true. Uh, and to, do you find that, that that sort of um, willingness to challenge the discourse and to be made uncomfortable is alive and well? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's interesting because going back to um, um, when Emilio, who was my, my Bush predecessor, uh, came to speak in the class, um, I, I didn't want a Jabberwocky incident to happen in the class. I was worried that it might happen. Um, but both in the context of our discussion in the group and then after, when people just got to talk to uh, Emilio one-on-one, -on -one, people, you know, they went at it. Um, and, you know, Emilio's a, a former Army colonel, very imposing guy. Uh, and, and people were unafraid, really, to, to challenge him. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think that spirit very much still lives on. That's, and he was game? Uh, oh, he was, he was loving it, actually. You know, he was, he, <laughs> he's still thanking me now. Um, you know, we, I think the other thing that I thought it was important for the students to see, um, we disagree with each other violently. There are things he thinks that I think are, are, are downright immoral. Uh, but we still find a way, one, to actually do good things together, um, uh, and, and two, to just get along and be able to talk and communicate, which, you know, it, it's a necessity, at least for some of us, to be able to have those dialogues in order to be able to drive progress on some of these issues. It's been one of my favorite things about the Senior Fellows programs, that we get people from all sides, and this, it's good for the students. Um, I have so many more questions, but I'm just going to ask you two more. The first one is, since we're talking about your personal life, what did you concentrate in? Uh, history. OK. Yeah. Um, what about your family history um, made you go into this kind of work, including a lot of civil rights work? Um, wow. Um, so my, uh, my, uh, my parents um, and my grandparents were all refugees from Cuba. Um, I mentioned Hyas before. Uh, they were actually all assisted by Hyas. Uh, with one exception was my maternal grandfather, who was a Hyas volunteer, actually, in Cuba, both during the mass uh, post-Castro exodus, 
Uh, and also back during World War II when large numbers of European refugees were finding their way into the West generally, including Cuba, and he would assist uh, many of those refugees. Um, he um, actually died before he got to the US. So I was born here and I never got to meet him, and he is this very towering figure to me. Um, so, something that kind of lived in the back of my mind. I was not any kind of immigration professional before I went to USCIS. I was very involved. I was a, a lawyer in the Justice Department Civil Rights Division. I headed the Civil Rights Office at HHS. Um, and I actually was asked by now Homeland Security Mayorkas, whose background is actually very similar, ethnic background is very similar to mine, uh, to serve as director of USCIS, and I discovered a passion I didn't realize I had, and a relationship to this grandfather that had been sort of simmering under the surface uh, all, all, all of those years. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the story. Thanks for sharing that. Right. Um, and what is, what do you, how do you, well, let me ask my last question, um, which wasn't my last question, but I really want to give everybody else a chance. Um, I wonder if you could sort of help us square to these contradictory narratives in America or facts about America. And one is this narrative that we tell ourselves about being a nation who welcomes the, the Statue of Liberty narrative. Um, and the hist long history of sometimes virulent anti-immigrant laws and sentiment and those are still alive and well and so are both true is one more true um so th this actually takes me back to uh professor mclaughlin because he, he would always teach us to to look for what is the culture core um in one way in which i think i e either either he meant to teach me this and i didn't get it or, or in which i actually disagree with professor mclaughlin um, there is not just one culture core. In, in a country this big, uh, this diverse, this complex, there is not one culture core. And so I think there is, unfortunately, there is a culture core that is xenophobic, that is racist, uh, that is deeply fearful of change, uh, deeply fearful of government too, interestingly. Uh, and then there is another that is welcoming, that very much um, um, subscribes to to the immigration narrative, the, you know, the idea of the U.S. as a nation uh, of immigrants and 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 a nation in constant improvement. Um, and so, I, I think the 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 only way to sort of not just move to France is to understand that we are both we are both countries, and that candidly, every other country is also. You know that, that so so I I was taught you know, my my you know they, we all have a or not not all of us but many of us can reach sort of this like sort of America sucks portion of our life they all the others suck too uh, and they don't suck too in in the sense that all countries all societies are complex and they both have you know downright evil alongside very good. And in, in, in to be very to, to be binary about that uh, misses the point completely uh, of what of what's actually going on in any in any given place. It's both and. Both and. It's a great answer, um, Leanne. I could pepper you with questions all day, but I think um, I'd love to open it up. We have a few more minutes. Um, if anyone has a question, just come on up to the mic and tell us who you are and what you'd like to know. Yeah. Hi, um, welcome to people. <clears throat> My name is Eckhart Jumo. I'm a, uh, an alum and also a parent of a Brown student. Um, I would guess that if you <coughs> asked uh, a typical person walking down the street what the average stay in a refugee camp would be, they'd say probably six to 12 months, I would guess. But I understand it's more like. 12 to 15 years. Um, is, that, is that true? That is true. And I mean, well, well, I'm sorry. It really depends on the population. So there are um, uh, refugee camps in Africa in particular 
where there are populations that are, have, are, are there now, um, have been there for decades, and will probably live their entire lives in those, in those refugee camps with no meaningful hope of resettlement uh, in, in another country. Uh, there are other populations that either get absorbed into the countries uh, where they went um, um, or, or ultimately do get resettled somewhere where they've requested resettlement. But yeah, there, there are certainly, that is certainly not a very common outcome for some refugees that they basically get stuck in this transitional environment for their entire life. My ultimate question is, given just a very general, generalizing, but in your crystal ball, just given the dynamics of the world and trends, would you say that that average is going to accelerate longer or the other direction? You know, I think the, uh, why, uh, you're making me think of something that I hadn't dared to think about, which is that with climate displacement, I think is a real possibility that we will have sort of these permanently displaced and possibly wandering populations. I, that, that, I don't even know how to start thinking about that, but I think it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm an alum. My name is Barbara. Um, what can we do right now, like regular people living um, their lives? Well, I think becoming part of a welcoming circle uh, is one uh, uh, incredible way. I think political advocacy um, is, uh, there's, there's lots of room for it. Um, I mean, I think, I think especially those of you who live in, in redder parts of the country, um, reminding, uh, you know, that the fact the Republican Party did have a tradition of support for refugees, uh, and, and kind of, you know, shifting the culture back a bit on that point. Um, the refugee resettlement organizations, all of them need uh, money and support. So, you know, money still helps a lot. I um, wouldn't make that the first thing I asked for, but uh, it's certainly a, a, a way to help. And then, and then community volunteering, working with uh, uh, refugee populations. There are pretty much in any major uh, urban area, there are going to be probably multiple refugee resettlement organizations uh, uh, working and, and you know the part part of the the thing here is, in addition to all the other difficulties of being a refugee, being any any kind of immigrant um, is, you know, flat out loneliness. Um, you know, you're you're in a place where the language is new, the culture is new. Remember when we used to prepare refugees to come over, we would teach them the U.S. banking system. We would teach them. Uh, you know, how to get to the beach because so much of what is life here was different from where they were coming from. So, so literally just engaging with the populations is something that, that um, you know, is, is, is a way that, that very much can help. That's a great question. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let's take this side. Hi, I'm Felicia Busto. I'm a parent of a freshman. Two quick things. So the first one is, other than the one-off um, private charter flight to Martha's Vineyard, it seems that so many buses right now are being sent to the big cities like New York and Washington, D.C., and these cities are already struggling with issues like homelessness, yeah. affordable housing, um, education overcrowding, underfunding. So what is your solution for those cities? I think the, 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 the federal government, uh, and, I, and I think they're waking up to it, um, they're going to have to uh, take some action to, at a minimum, support those cities uh, in absorbing those populations. But, but what is it going to take for us, I mean, to get yeah. to that point where they agree to do so and actually put plans into place? I, I think we're there. I think, I think we're not far from hearing. Uh, um, you know, some 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 sort of plan. You know, because when you have a city like like uh, like New York, mm -hmm. which is huge, pretty wealthy, but also has you know plenty of problems, uh, throwing up its hands and essentially declaring a state of emergency, that's telling you something that that yeah. this has already exceeded the capacity of even you know the bluest, most open city. I remember, you know, New York City is a city that funds uh, deportation defense for its residents. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if a city like that is saying uncle, that means it's a pretty big problem. And I, th and I think the federal government's getting that message and knows that they have to 
So, so my step second in. thing is not a question, it's just a, a little anecdote. Um, so after I dropped my daughter off, I had a little extra time on my hand, she's my last child, and I started volunteering with a grassroots organization. I live in New York City at Port Authority. I don't know where you live, Barbara. And so, you know, New York City is there, um, taking in all of the refugees who are being sent up on buses from Texas, but they're they're doing it in a very clinical way. They're mainly moving them to shelters, even if there are people yeah. who have relatives willing to take them in. So this grassroots organization, we offer them you know, a meal, we have clothing stands set up for them, some stuffed animals and toys for the kids, and it's heartbreaking. I mean, some of these people, they're mainly Venezuelan. Um, they left Venezuela. It took them two months to get to this country. Different yeah. modes of transportation. You can kind of tell what economic um, background they come from because some have like small wheelie suitcases or backpacks. Others are showing up with like a little plastic little CVS bundle. bag with maybe three articles of clothing in it and it breaks. They are so resilient. It brings tears to your eyes. The women and the children are pretty tired, especially they've just gotten off a bus. Most of the buses don't recline. So they're sitting on a bus coming up from Texas for, for you know two and a half, three days. The men, all they want to do is work. They, most of them do have cell phones with pay-as-you-go plans. They're you know, reaching back home, but it's just such a beautiful thing. So if you're in, in this organization is in New York or DC, collect clothing, warm clothing, because they're coming in with t-shirts. Almost everybody has flip-flops, shorts, but I'll, I'll speak to you after if you want, but it's, um, That's they're great. just thank, thank they're you beautiful for... and they're resilient and, and they want to be here. And they say this is the first time in this country they've seen a happy face because they just didn't get it where they were in Texas. So it's. It's, uh, you know, what you were saying about community involvement, it's just so important. Well, and the, and the Venezuelan journey has been, you know, uniquely harrowing because of, of their particular path was, you know, through sort of these jungle, mountainous jungle terrains, and many people have died along the way. I mean, it's, it's uh, in a particular... By the way, I also am the parent of a, of a freshman who is our last one to leave, and uh, uh, one of my classmates at Brown, who was a psychologist, coined the term open nester rather than empty nester. Um, because among other things, they come back. Um, so hopefully that's... <laughs> uh, I think this gentleman... Yeah, I, I, was I just, haven't forgotten you. Okay, I was oh, just sorry. wondering if you could give us some examples of current climate refugees and how that's anticipated to play out, let's just say, over the next decade. Yeah, I, um, I, I know that they exist. I honestly don't know where they are uh, specifically. My, my assumption is that they're in the southern hemisphere, probably in, in parts of Africa. Um, and most of this will play out in, in, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and will be migration, at least in the early going, uh, from one poor country to another poor country. In fact, most migration even now is among one countries in, in the southern parts of the world in countries that are not countries like the United States and England and France with a lot of wealth, but are countries that actually don't have wealth and don't have the governmental institutions to absorb, uh, absorb those people. So unfortunately, we're probably going to see more of that. Um, as, as, as climate displacement really starts taking, taking hold. Um, let, let me describe a situation that I think is sort of an uh, unfortunate fallout from the anti-immigration stance which seems to be in place in this country, and then ask you a question about it. I'm a trustee of a university in New York, uh, which is just in the sciences. Um, it's won 25 Nobel Prizes for its work in the biological sciences. Every year it graduates 75 PhD students who come from all over the world. Probably two-thirds of them come from non-U.S. In other words, 50 are, are from non-U.S., 25 from U.S. Up until 10 years ago, we used to keep, of that 50 non-U.S. contingent, we'd probably keep 35 or 40 in this country. Mm -hmm. They'd get visas, these people would go teach, They'd start biotech companies, they'd employ lots of people. And today, we fight like crazy to get visas for two or three of them, because there are no visas right. that are made available. So this crackdown has eliminated visas for these very talented people who are hardworking and want to start companies and want to uh, do well here. These people don't stay here anymore. They go to Britain, for the most part. They're, they're not welcomed here. So my question is, this seems to me to be a, an issue which could, could, could generate real bipartisan support. I don't see how you could be against this idea. 
and yet nothing seems to happen about it. We've tried hard to get support for uh, more of these visas, and we get nowhere. So the couple of observations. One, the, the, the foundation of the problem that you're describing um, is that the, our current employment-based visa system, that its structure and size are from the mid-1960s. Uh, when our country was much, much smaller and our economy was smaller. Uh, and so we literally have actually net-net, we have less room for the talent that we are educating uh, here, here in the U.S. So I think that's the cause of, of that problem. The reason why something that would seem obvious and bipartisan to, you know, the, the, the outrageously talented people that you're describing um, all of these issues are wired together politically at this point. Um, and, and because they are wired together, because we can't reach consensus on the border in particular, and because so much political energy uh, uh, is directed at the border, um, it leaves very little political will left to deal with the problem uh, that you're talking about, even though I will tell you that I um, interact daily with Republican advocates who are saying exactly what you just said, um, but who, when you start talking about actual elected officials, uh, the reality is that it's all, as long as we're talking, as long as we're busy, busy talking about the border, we're not talking about what you're talking about. Yes. in the refugee space this past summer. Um, I'm currently writing a paper on the reception of refugees from different groups, so Afghanistan, Syria, and Ukraine. Um, and I was wondering, as working in the US and USCIS, I was wondering if you felt there was like a difference in the culture or attitude towards the, like these different groups overall. So I do think there was, um, there was definitely a, a suspicion in our in our culture, especially as sort of our national security folks, a particular suspicion of refugees from um, countries with large Muslim populations, um, and so that that is a way in which those countries and refugees from those countries were treated differently. Uh, than those who come from other might be coming from other from other places, so yeah, I do think there is a, a, a bias. You know, part of it is you know you see ISIS in Iraq or something like that, so it's driven by that. But then, you know, there was sort of a willingness to then uh, really run with the narrative far more than the facts necessarily uh, supported. And I recall when we began uh, social media vetting of refugees, and I forget what country this individual was from, but it was the, the guy whose page it was was this uh, very large, very muscular, very fit, um, and, and there were things on the page, it was all in Arabic, so nobody understood it on this particular team. We had no Arabic speakers in this group, um, and everybody thought that this was a, a bad guy just because there, there was just something very aggressive about the way the page just sort of looked. So it turns out that the guy was actually a muscle car enthusiast. Uh, and so what we interpreted as signals that were, were sort of bad guy symbols were just sort of exp his expression of how much he liked muscle cars. Uh, and and it, it, it underscored to me that you know, we, you know, the people were bringing you know, this, this mindset to what they were looking at. Uh, that often made them go off completely in the wrong direction. And sure enough, you know, we're now eight or so years into the heavy use of social media vetting. Uh, and he, we have really to hear about any substantial disruption of terroristic activity because of social media vetting. Uh, and look, and I'm, I'm, I will be candid. I was a participant in standing that, that vetting up, so I'm not... Not, I'm not, I'm not um, a, um, advocating my own responsibility in what we did. We, we believed it was needed cover to be able to accomplish our goals. Uh, but in fact, we sort of created a little bit of a monster, I, I've come to believe. 
All right, one yeah. last question. Hi, um, my name is Laura Landro. I'm a sort of a grandma to a student here. Um, and I wonder if you can briefly say, you know, talking about attitudes towards different types of refugees, I think a lot of people were looking at Ukrainian refugees and saying, the opposite of what they might have said about the ISIS, you know, there's right. Iraq is, oh, they look just like they could have been at a bus depot in Cleveland. They look just like us, bring them on in. But if you say immigration reform, on the one hand you have people that, should that mean everybody can get in? Or does it mean nobody can get in? You know, we have an illegal immigration system, we have a path to citizenship. What needs to be done to make it work to, to recalibrate for what's happening in the world right. in terms of just the vast numbers? That might be too complicated for you to ask in one second. No, 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 no. But, but, but you have to, there, there's a few things that, um, and they're not necessarily crazy things, at least, you know, there are a few things that Republicans are looking for um, as sort of must-haves in a comprehensive immigration reform package. And, you know, there were comprehensive immigration reform packages that came perilously close to passage both in 2007 and 2012, one under Bush, one under Obama. And, you know, they are looking for investments in border security, and they're looking for mandatory use of E-Verify, e which is, you know, basically a system to make sure that absolutely every individual who tries to work in the United States is legally eligible to work. So those are two critical Republican goals that are part of any package. Um, but then there is, there has been, there was in, in, in 2007 and 2012, a willingness to come around on all the other issues, uh, including um, uh, status for dreamers, uh, some path to citizenship for other uh, long-time undocumented residents, expanding uh, in, uh, availability of employment-based visa slots. All those things have actually been on the table in any kind of cooperative discussion between Democrats and Republicans, it's around the margins uh, where these things get blown up. And at the end of the day, we're stuck in that inertia that I talked about at the beginning where none of us, too many of us don't care enough to really lean on our political leaders to actually just get it done already. Um, I will also say that the Dreamer issue in particular is in danger of becoming an emergency because uh, the, the DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, uh, was invalidated by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals just a couple of weeks ago. Um, eventually, this, it's not far from going all the way up to the Supreme Court. With this configuration, there is a pretty decent risk that the program in its totality will be invalidated, which will back Congress into a corner where it will have to, at least about that one issue, will have to do something. And on that sort of weirdly optimistic note. <laughs> Leon, thank you so thank much. You. Everybody, yeah. please. Oh. Yeah.